sound room. It's amazing as a pastor the things that you see and hear from up here and up there, and somehow the Lord sustains you just to keep on rolling. Um, but, anyways, if you've got your Bible tonight, go ahead and turn with me back to the chapter where we're talking about the golden calf. Uh, last week we introduced this in Exodus 32, and we talked about, uh, we just kind of laid a foundation last week, and today we're going to revisit it. Uh, so Moses, again, was up on the mountain. Uh, the Israelites are there on their own for, what, 40 days, and uh, this, this period of, of testing, and eventually they become restless, not only with their leader, but also with, with the Lord. And uh, they <laughs> cry out to their second in command, Aaron, Moses' brother. Uh, he, they tell him to go and to make and to carve out gods, plural. So by doing that, they rejected monotheism. They rejected the worship of the one true God. And they're really exposing what's been inside their heart the whole time. Uh, they really weren't fully trusting in the Lord. They were trusting in who they were worshiping in the past. and uh, So today we're going to see how the Lord responds to the rebellion, but we're also going to see how Moses as their leader responds as well. So Exodus 32, beginning in verse number 7. Uh, I'm going to read seven or eight verses. The Bible says this, Exodus 32, verse number 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt. Uh, they've, they have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I have commanded them, and they have made for themselves a golden calf, and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and that I may consume them, in order to, that I may make a great nation out of you. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent, Did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord, this is how the Lord responded, and the Lord relented from the disaster that He had spoken of bringing on His people. Uh, so we're going to stop today. We're going to deal with these seven or eight verses tonight. Let me ask you a question before we dig in. I may have said it just a second ago, but how long was Moses up on the mountain? How long was he there? Forty days and forty nights. Again, last week we talked about this forty days of testing. How long was the Lord in the wilderness? Right. So this this is a common theme throughout Scripture. Forty days of testing. Now Moses was up on the mountain for forty days and forty nights, but what was he doing up there? Does anybody remember? Yes. Miss Sue Ellen's right. Just as a review, he was receiving God's law. Uh, he was receiving instructions on the tabernacle, how to ordain his brother Aaron. All of these instructions, basically God was teaching Moses how they're supposed to worship the right way. Now, can you imagine Moses spending 40 days communing with the Lord, receiving all of this insight. God was revealing His will to Moses. I mean, this literally and figuratively and spiritually was a mountaintop experience for Moses, right? He's on top of the mountain literally, and spiritually he's on top of the mountain. Spending 40 days concentrated time as God is revealing Himself. But here, <laughs> what we just read is that while the Lord is uh, drawing up plans for the temple, while He's doing all this, at that very same exact time that God's given instructions to worship, what are the Israelites doing? 
They're literally offering worship to a cow. They're literally breaking those laws that the Lord has, has just given to them. They're making some plans of their own. Now, isn't it so neat? This again is a reminder of God's character. See, God didn't have to go down the mountain to see what the Israelites were doing. He knew it all, right? And while Moses was completely oblivious, the Lord knew. Um, something went wrong. Look at verse number 7 again. The Bible says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Something went wrong, right? Things seemed to be going right. It seemed like the people were going to follow the Lord. And then they just run off the... I mean, they fall off the side of the cliff. I mean, what, what are they doing? In a matter of really... You say 40 days? In a matter of just really a few weeks, these people who the Lord had called just were shipwrecked. I mean, they're bowing down to a cow. They decided to go back to the God of their own life. Uh, they're liking. In fact, look at verse number 8. It says, They have turned aside quickly. You see the word there? It didn't take them very long to turn back to those things that were hidden in their heart all along. This is a good reminder to us. When the Lord confronts us with sin or idolatry in our life, that's why it's so important in those moments to turn to the Lord and ask Him, hey, Lord, don't... We shouldn't pray, Lord, change my behavior. We really need to get down to the heart of the issue and say, Lord, take the idols, take the sin out of my heart. You know, it's, it's, it's going to do us no good if we change our behavior because those things are still going to be hidden in our hearts. That's why whenever I encourage people to make war on sin, to get the sin out of their life, don't just uh, put up these safeguards. Yeah, that's helpful, but... Even though you turn off the television, even though you get rid of the smartphone, even though you do that, if you never get rid of the idols in your heart, that sin's still going to manifest itself. All those idols that were in the Israelites' heart from Egypt, what they're doing in verses 7 and 8 is what's really been in their heart all along. So that's, again, why it's important to ask the Lord, remove it. Don't focus on behavior modification. Focus on... Your heart. All right, so the point is number one, Israel was engaging in idolatry. But notice number two, the Lord wasn't going to let this sin slide. Uh, let's notice his judgment. What is sin? We talk about sin a lot, but as believers, what, is, what does God's word say sin is? Sin is breaking God's law, sin is breaking God's commandments. All sin, every single sin, deserves what? Death. It deserves punishment. You're exactly right. Well, this is exactly what the Lord promised. Look at verse number 9 in your Bibles. The Bible says this, And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Therefore, now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, that I might consume them, in order that I may make a great nation out of you. Now, this is a word that, there's a word used here in verse number 9 that's very unique. Uh, he calls them a stiff-necked people. Now, what does stiff-necked mean? Caroline, sit up, little lady. Yes, that's a good, that's a very helpful description of what stiff-necked means. Uh, this term is used a lot in the Bible to describe animals or uh, mules uh, that don't want to take their master's yoke. They don't want to do what their master is telling them to do. Uh, what does a stiff-necked person look like? We just talked about an animal. What is a stiff-necked person? Likewise, they don't want to do what their master tells them to do. Uh, they don't want to lower their heads down. They want to stiffen up. They don't want to take the yoke of obedience. They're just so rebellious. That's a bad place to be as a person. To be a stiff-necked person is dangerous spiritually. Let me give you some marks or some characteristics of a stiff-necked person or stiff-necked people. This was true of the Israelites, but did you know this could also mark people today? There are even stiff-necked people within the local church. 
Uh, here's some examples. A stiff-necked person always thinks they're right. They never admit when they're wrong. A stiff-necked person, um, when they're doing wrong, they refuse to be corrected. Somebody goes to them and says, hey, I don't think I would do this, or if you continue this, you're going to fall off the way. They won't take it. They, just, they buck up, and they won't, they won't humble themselves. They refuse correction. Stiff-necked people always give excuses for what they're doing. They're not humble. Stiff-necked people never change, and they never grow. Dangerous place to be spiritually. Never truly bow in submission to God. Now, all right, so we've talked about the definition of someone that's stiff-necked. We've talked about how people can be stiff-necked. How can we guard against being stiff-necked? What can we do to put up safeguards where we're not, we don't find ourselves in the same place as the Israelites? Let me give you some... Right? I want to give you guys some examples. I don't know if I left room on your paper, but it might be helpful to write this down. When you're wrong, admit it. <laughs> That's one good surefire way to get rid of a stiff neck. Also, humble yourself. Assume you can make a mistake. Of course, I couldn't, but I'm just kidding. Uh, always assume you can make a mistake. If someone tries to give you positive biblical advice, what should you do? Listen to them. Don't just say, well, I've already got this figured out. <laughs> Listen. Also, another cure for stiff neckness is whenever you're going through suffering, learn from it. A stiff necked person goes through suffering and they never learn a lesson from it. The Lord can teach you. Another way that we can learn not to be stiff neckedness is to listen to God's word and be ready to obey it. Uh, here, here's something else that I added to your paper. What happens to an individual? Let's use the Israelites as an example. What happens if a person continues in to be stiff-necked? What happens if, after being warned about stiff-neckedness, we continue to just do the same thing? We don't listen to advice. We don't submit to God's Word. We just, it makes us even more uh, tense. What happens? What? Right, yeah. That's a good example. Right. We could summarize it by saying this. The Lord will treat you like He did the Israelites. So severe punishment could be heading your way. Uh, you think of a stiff-necked animal. Uh, some of you guys may have been around just <laughs> ornery animals, cows. You try to get them in the barn, and man, they'll bust through sheet metal. Just, I mean, they're just stubborn. What do you have to do? You can break tabas tobacco sticks over their head. Sometimes they just will not listen. So what do you do? You send them to the hill, right? You get rid of them. Uh, I've got to be careful how I use this illustration. But the point is this. Many times the Lord breaks us many, in the same way that a farmer might break an animal or an ox. Now here in this context, what's the Lord do? He threatens to destroy these people. Um, he given them how many chances to obey? <laughs> Numerous chances. And they continue to be stiff-necked. I mean, because of their rebellion, honestly, the Lord had the right to just completely wipe them off the face of the earth. But what does He do? Up until this point in Scripture, the Lord has always referred to the Israelites as His people. Let me give you some examples. In Exodus chapter 3, verse number 7, the Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Exodus chapter 3, verse number 10, bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, let my people go. Alright, so in the past, you have all of this. Come down, sit down. 
You have all of these uh, possessive pronouns, but now, here in this chapter, the language changes. What does he say? He uses a second person possessive. In verse number 7, he says, go down for your people. That's what he tells Moses. So he did have, he, he was saying, hey, they're mine, but now he shifts it. Uh, and, and honestly, the Israelites didn't deserve to be called God's people. Look at verse number 10. It says, Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, that I may consume them, in order that I may make you a great nation. Now, I'm going to talk about this punishment for just a second. In verse number 10, God is threatening what? Destroy. You're exactly right. So I looked up the word uh, in the Hebrew for destruction. Uh, it's spelled K-A-L-A-H. It, it, some of your translations may say consume. Uh, the original Hebrew literally means to execute ultimate sentence. Literally to make an end to Israel. Nobody left. That's what the Lord was threatening in verse number 10. Now, if, let's say right here in the Bible, the Lord decides to ultimately annihilate the nation of Israel. Would He have been just to do that? Would, he, would that have been just? Would that have been righteous and true? Yeah. So if the Lord did just completely wipe them out, uh, we have to understand sin always deserves judgment. Every single time. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. So death, uh, punishment's always justified. Uh, now this is a good reminder to us. The Israelites, a stiff-necked people, deserve to be annihilated. This is a good warning for people that are stiff-necked today, right? Ultimately, what they really deserve is destruction. Um, Listen to this. I found this as I was studying. Romans chapter 2, verse number 5 says this, Because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Alright, let, let me just review what we've talked about so far. We've talked about Israel. we talked about how they're just completely messing up right now. We're talking about their idolatry. We also talked about God's judgment. Really, they deserve to be wiped out. But now let's see number three, God's grace. I want to fill in your blanks right quick, Miss Caroline. Okay. I'll fill in these blanks on your paper. Even in God's threat of judgment, there were still signs that God would show grace. Even in the, these harsh verses... There's a hand of grace. Uh, let me fill in your next blank. It was never God's purpose to destroy the Israelites, but only to save them. Now, I want to show you here in this passage hints of God's grace. Where do we see that at? The first hint of God's grace in this destructive passage is seen when He tells Moses to go down to the people. If God was bent on destroying the Israelites, He would have never told Moses to go. He would have just wiped them out right then. But God in His grace makes a way. Um, he was planning on saving them through the mediator. Another hint of God's grace, number two on your paper, is God refers to the Israelites as Moses' people. Now, the Lord worked me over on this point here. What I mean by that is I had a false interpretation in the past of what this verse meant. Now let me explain to you. Here in this Whenever you get down to uh, verse number 7, it says, Go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land. I always thought that the Lord was blaming Moses for their actions. But that's not an accurate, that's not an accurate interpretation. When God talks like this in verse number 7, what He's doing is, is He's identifying Moses with the people. Moses is being identified with the people. Why? Because he's their intercessor. He is their mediator. This is actually not showing that the Lord is harsh. It's showing that the Lord is graceful. 
He's allowing Moses to intercede for those people. He says, Moses, these are your people. He's attaching Moses with these heathen people because if anybody could do anything with them, who would it be? Their intercessor. It would have been Moses. He was the only one that could save them. Does everybody understand what I'm, I'm trying to say in that verse? All right. It's not God being harsh. He's allowing Moses to identify with. All right. The third hint of grace is this. In verse number 10, God attaches a condition on the thread of His judgment. I see people still writing. I'm going to read verse number 10. It says, Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation out of you. I want to read to you something that I found as I was studying this week. Uh, old preacher said this about verse number 10. He's dead and gone now, but I want to read to you. God vows the severest punishment imaginable, but then suddenly He, he conditions it, as it were, on Moses' agreement. Let me alone that I may consume them. The effect is that God Himself leaves the door open for intercession. He allows Himself to be persuaded. That's what a mediator is for. He says, Consider the compassionate kindness of God. When He says, Let me alone, He shows that if Moses will continue to pretty much make intercessions by praying, He will not strike. In other words, what He says, Do not cease your persistent entreaty, and I shall not strike. So, God uses this thread of, of judgment with Moses in order that Moses will be compelled to pray for him, to intercede for him. God says, hey, I'm going I'm to wipe them out. And that stirs, that stirs Moses up to where he says, oh Lord, no, please don't. And he makes intercession for him. Uh, which leads us to our fourth point. Moses prays. Guys, when I use the language Moses intercedes, what I'm meaning by that is he's praying to the Lord. When you hear someone say intercessions, I'm, I'm participating in intercession, that means praying. It goes back to our Christianese language, right, from this morning. Uh, to intercede means to pray. All right. Something else that I found in this verse. I, I'm telling you, sometimes I get to studying and I get so excited because I think, man, I get, I get to share this on Sunday night with the folks. So I want to share something with you that I was excited about as I was studying this past week. In verse number 10, did you know verse number 10 was a test for Moses? You say, how so, Brother Travis? How so, Brother Travis? <laughs> Thank you, bro. <laughs> it is a test for Moses. Here's the question. Would Moses intercede for the people? Uh, would he intercede so that everybody back at camp wouldn't be wiped out? You see, at the very last part of verse number 10, this is the amazing part for me. He said, in order that I may make a great nation out of you. There's the test. So, all the Israelites were children of who? Starts with A and ends in Abraham. Right. The children of Abraham were the Israelites. But now here is the test. If those people got wiped out back at camp, then the Lord's saying, I can make a great nation out of Moses. So they would be children of Moses. You see this test here? This is a, a, a spiritual test for the spiritual leader. Would he continue to intercede for the people God called him to? Or would he say, no, nah, I think I want to uh, gain glory for myself. I want, I want to be the father of this nation. I've never seen this before. All right. Here's your fill in the blank, Caroline. To save Israel, Moses had to turn down the opportunity to make a name for himself. So here's a question. Did Moses pray for the people or did he pursue his own selfish ambitions? What did he do? He was a good leader, right? He passed the test. When given the choice between making a name for himself or serving the people, he chose to the better good for the people rather than the good for himself. This is a, a true mark of a man of God. And so making a name for themselves, they take the road that's going to bring the most good 
for the people and the most glory to the Lord's name. All right, look at... See where we got to. Let's look at the first part of verse number 11. It says, But Moses implored the Lord. Basically, Moses is begging God. That's what that word implored means. He's begging God for mercy. Verse 11, the last part, it says, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? I mean, I don't think we give Moses enough credit. We, uh, I mean, here's a man who's leading just a sinful group of people. And instead of just giving up and getting a new group of people, he loved them. And so he makes intercession for them. He was a good spiritual leader. Uh, he was their mediator. That's your blank. Moses was their mediator, the one who stood in the gap for them before the Lord. All right. We got to verse 11. Moses prays. For the people, he was their mediator. He stands between a sinful people and the holy God. What did the Lord do? Did he listen to Moses? All right. He did. The Lord did listen. Uh, I didn't write this on your paper. I wish I would have. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse number 25, talks about Moses praying uh, to the Lord, making an intercession. It says this, So I lay prostrate, prostrate before the Lord for these 40 days and 40 nights because the Lord has said He would destroy you. I mean, he didn't just pray a little five-second prayer. I mean, he is, He's laid out. I mean, just, he's really making intercession. Moses prays. Notice what happens in verse number 14. And the Lord relented from the disaster that He had spoken of bringing on His people. Here's a trick question. Be careful how you answer. Did God change His mind in verse number 14? I'm not disagreeing. I want to hear what folks have to say. Right. Yes, yes. We'll stop there. There's a group of people uh, that teach and preach what we call open theism. You guys didn't know that term. Open theism. You're saying, I don't care about that term. Well, let me tell you why you should care. There's a group of people out there that says, well, yeah, God changes His mind. Is that biblical? Does God change His mind? Well, the Bible doesn't teach that God changes His mind. In fact, the Bible says there is no shadow due to change. I'll look up that verse after church. It just comes to mind. In fact, look at verse number 14. It says, And the Lord relented from the disaster. Here's the point. God had planned on showing mercy all along. That was God's plan. That's why Moses got involved in the first place. His plan was to work through the mediator, to work through Moses in order that the people could be saved. Here's a verse that complements this. In fact, while I'm thinking about it, you might want to write it next to verse number 14. I'm going to write it in my Bible, or I'll forget it. Uh, Psalm 106. Verse number 23. Listen to what the Bible says. Therefore, He said He would destroy them had not Moses, and here's the point, His chosen one stood in the breach before Him to turn away His wrath from destroying them. So from this passage and from Psalm 106, we see that Moses was not changing God's plans. In fact, Moses was carrying out God's plans. You see the difference? People use this passage and twist it and say, Moses changed God's mind. No, God knew all along He's going to save these people. And He uses Moses to do that. Alright, let's move on to number five. 
Moses makes his case. Now, how did Moses pers persuade God to restrain his wrath? How did he do that? Let's look at it this way. What did Moses not do? Let's not talk about what he did do. Let's talk about what he didn't do. First thing he didn't do is he didn't minimalize Israel's sin. He knew that they were sinners. A lot of times we like to justify sin or cover it over. But Moses didn't do that. He didn't argue with the Lord and say, Lord, you're being angry. Really? You shouldn't, you shouldn't get mad at these people. You really just need to love them. No, Moses hadn't even gone off the mountain yet and he took God's word for it. He knew the people were probably uh, sinning. He didn't even go down to see for himself. He knew that the Lord had the right to wipe them out. You know, there's another example in Scripture of Abraham, and Abraham intercedes for a city. You remember who? Do you rem Somebody said it. Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah. You're right. So, you remember there's sort of this dialogue where Abraham says, hey, if there's such and such righteous people in the city, will you, will you spare it? You guys remember this story? And then he reduces it down. Well, Moses don't even go there. He knows that there's none righteous back at the camp. He doesn't even... He knew that they were sinful. Now, let's notice what Moses appeals to. When he makes his case before the Lord not to just wipe them out, Moses doesn't appeal to the people's character or their merit. He knows all these people are messed up. Instead, he appeals to God's character. Lord, save them not on the basis of who they are. Save them on the basis of your character and your attributes. Listen, look at the first one. The first reason why Moses said that the Lord shouldn't wipe them out is because of the Lord's fatherly affection. Because He's a good father. You know, Israel didn't do something to earn their sonship. God is the one who chose them. He's the one that set apart the nation of Israel. It was out of love. He adopted them. Uh, if you're taking notes, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 the Bible says, Israel is my firstborn son. Israel couldn't change who their father was. They didn't choose their paternity. Uh, God chose them. What this means is that when Moses is praying for the people, he's reminding the, the Lord that there's nothing that Israel can do. They can't send themselves out of being a son, out of being... God's child. Does that make sense? Uh, now let me make an application for us for today as we go through these points. The same is true for us today. Uh, when we come to God through faith and through the blood of His Son, there's nothing that we as believers can do to be removed as a child of God. That's encouraging, right? John chapter 10, verse number 29 says this, No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So, going back, does, do we need to take a, a jumping jack? For, is that what you call them? To get everybody awake? Alright. Uh, first reason Moses says that God shouldn't wipe them out is one, fatherly affection. Number two is this. Moses appeals to God's past investment. His past investment. Look at verse number 11. Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? Moses says, hey, Lord, you've, you've got a lot invested in these guys. You've got a lot of time, a lot of resources. Uh, you remember all those miracles you performed back in Egypt? Why would you, why would you waste all of that? Uh, Lord, all of that, all the salvation that you provided, the exodus, all this big scene that you create, why would you invest a lot in these people? Don't just wipe them out. So that's what Moses is doing. Uh, why stop now? You're too deeply involved. Uh, why would he destroy the people he'd taken so much trouble to save? The Lord wasn't going to. The Lord wasn't going to abandon them just part of the way in their journey, in their pilgrimage. Here's the application for us today. You know, when we think about sin and we think about all of these things, it's tempting for the Christian, the believer, to slide into a place where they think, well, I've sinned to the point where the Lord's just abandoned me. I can't run to His grace any longer. 
the reality is the Lord's not going to abandon us in our pilgrimage. When the Lord begins a work in you, the Bible tells us He's going to bring it to completion. The moment you trusted in Christ, when you were saved by His grace, He didn't just get you so far and say, well, Travis, I've led you this far. You messed up way too far now. You're on your own. The Lord never says that. He says that to Israel and He says that to us. Philippians 1.6 is the verse I was just referring to. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus our Lord. Number three, Moses appealed to God on the basis of his public reputation. What he says is, Lord, you know what? One of the reasons why you saved these people was for your glory. Now, you brought them out of Egypt. You've led them this far. If you just take them out, Man, that's not going to look good for your name. <laughs> your public reputation. It's going to destroy it. So Moses' desire was for God's name to be exalted among all the nations. This is helpful for us. Let me give you an application before we go on. Moses was interceding and he wanted the people to be saved in order that God's name would be exalted. When you pray for your family members, when you pray for your children, when you pray for people in this community, the driving factor for our prayer should be what? God's name being exalted. When you make supplication for your family members, when you pray for them, the Lord wants to be glorified. The Lord wants to be, His name to be glorified. So when you pray for such and such, pray, Lord, save them so that Your name will be exalted. The Lord loves to answer prayers like that. He loves to save people for their good and for His glory. I mean, that's, to me, I don't know, that just seemed to click this past week. To enhance His reputation. Alright, that's one of the motivations for praying for lost. Let's look at number four as we move on. Moses is... Moses is... Moses appealed to God on the basis of his merciful compassion. What is mercy? Right. You're right. Both of you guys are right. Uh, see, sinners don't have the right to demand mercy. And God's not obligated to give mercy. But thankfully, one of God's attributes in Scripture is that He is a merciful God. He is a compassionate God. Nehemiah talks about this. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse number 31, calls Him a gracious and a merciful God. So whenever you're thinking through and you're interceding for the lost, when you're interceding for a sinning Christian, appeal to God's mercy. It may sound simply like this. Lord, I know they don't deserve this. I know they don't deserve to be saved. But please, on the basis of your character, save them. The Lord loves to answer prayers like that. Uh, I want to keep going. Number five. The last appeal that Moses made when he was praying was this. It was based on God's everlasting covenant. Moses appealed to God's covenant. Look at verse number 13. He says, remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it. All right. So, in this verse, we have listed three ordinary men. Abraham, Isaac... Wait, hold on. I'm, I'm getting off. Verse 13. Three ordinary men, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Three ordinary men, but they all had promises from the Lord. What did the Lord promise Abraham? Right. He promised him a people, and He promised Abraham a place. Those are the two things that God promised. 
then he repeated that promise that was originally to Abraham. He repeated them to the other two guys as well. See, God made a promise, and it's impossible for God to break His promises. God made a promise that He would make a people, and He would give them a place. All right, so here is the promise that relates to us. God has also made a promise that He will save everyone who comes to Him through the blood of Jesus. That's a promise. God can't go back on that promise. So for us, that's encouraging. He can't break it. Those that struggle to believe that they can be forgiven, they can remember the promise. Our salvation is made secure not on the basis of our obedience, but our salvation is made secure by the blood of Jesus. It's made secure by Jesus' obedience. God made this unbreakable promise. I want to give you a verse right quick. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says this, If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. God doesn't break His promises. All right, number six. I want to tie everything together. I want to show you guys how this passage points to Christ. So Moses finishes praying. Verse 14, The Lord relented from the disaster that He had spoken of bringing to His people. In the end, God does what He intended to do from the very beginning, and that's to save the people. Uh, God, this is your fill in the blank. God answered the prayer of the mediator whom He had appointed by saving the people that He had chosen. Exodus chapter 32 is a story of salvation. Caroline, this is a story of salvation of God's people. This story foreshadows what God has done for His people today. Moses is up on the mountain. People are sinning and carrying on. God knows that they're sinning. He sends a mediator to make intercession for them. The same thing happened with us. Instead of Moses being up on the mountain... It's God. God was up on His holy mountain. We're down here on earth. Like the Israelites, we're just wallowing in our filth, wallowing in our, in our rebellion. What we needed was somebody like Moses, right? Somebody that would step down off the mountain and make intercession for us. God has given us a mediator who saw our sin. Moses knew that they were sinning. Christ knew that we would sin but He still kept us as His people. He didn't just get rid of us. Paul says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says this in John chapter 3, verse number 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus is the mediator that come down off the mountain for us. He's the one who is praying and interceding for us even now. Romans chapter 8, verse number 34. I'm almost done. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Now, like Moses, Jesus is not interceding for us because we're good people. Jesus is interceding for us based on His righteous deeds. Hey, don't look at the people Remember the promise. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says this, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ of the righteous, for He is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Alright, we've got a lot here we've looked at. I want to share with you now how this can carry with you the rest of the week. Good Bible study, good theology, drives application. It's not enough if we just dig in tonight and, and draw out all these little pieces. we got to let the rubber meet the road. As Christians, those of you, you know, I know a lot of you guys, I know you're believers. This is how it applies to us tonight. As Christians, now we're called to intercede. How, how do we intercede? We pray. Who should we be praying for? 
We pray for unbelievers. We make intercession for them. We also pray for sinning Christians. That's your duty. That's, your, that's a pleasure that we have. A believer, when we pray, when you pray for lost people, when you pray, pray for people that are living in unrepentant sin who are Christians, pray like Moses and pray like the Lord. We should appeal to God's fatherly affection. Lord, you know, follow it out the way Moses did. Lord, You've chose them. Don't give up on them. Appeal to God on the basis of His investment. So maybe you have a son that's, that says he's saved, but he's just not living for the Lord. Or maybe it's a spouse. Or maybe it's, I don't know. Pray for him and intercede for him. And say, Lord, you've, you've brought him this far. Don't give up on him. And see how the Lord uses that prayer for His glory. Pray to the Lord on the basis of His public reputation. You know somebody at work. Lord, you know this person. You know the influence they have in this community. Lord, imagine what could happen if you save them and you, you bring them to that breaking point where they crowd to you in faith. You know, appeal to the Lord on the basis of His reputation. Appeal to the Lord on the basis of His compassion. Say, Lord, they don't deserve it, but Your Word says You're compassionate. And I know You can do it. Also, appeal to His everlasting covenant. God made a promise that He's going to save sinners. Make the appeal. Lord, You said You're going to save. Here's someone. Give me the words. Meet, tenderize their heart. That's one of my prayers a lot of times. Because we get our hearts get so hard. Alright. So the application tonight is to intercede like Moses. To intercede like Christ. Pray for non-believers. Pray for sinning Christians. Does anybody else have any questions tonight?